that we were able to work with partners who are starting to address some of these concerns. How do you address the narrative question in your work while you're still also trying to address the policy questions and, and so on and so forth? I think that was the question that came from our friends in New Jersey here. And so we were willing to interrogate those questions and those structures. And so what we'd like to highlight now in this next panel is a discussion around the role of narratives and how that shows up in the work that we do. Um, we're going to start with just a short video that is um, the result of a collaboration of two of the panelists that you're going to hear from today, uh, Women's Way and Compass Working Capital. Uh, we're so grateful that they were willing to share with us about in the very early stages of their um, building this uh, narrative project through their gender um, gender wealth um, institute, and so we are we are so grateful, and we are going to show just a short video of the experience, the lived experience of one participant, and then we're going to welcome up our panelists for the discussion. So we're going to just watch. <laughs> Hi, my name is Akira Presley, born and raised from West Philadelphia. I am 30 years old. I'm at the age of 25. I have moved over 20 times in my lifetime. It all started at the tender age of seven when I was taken away from my mom due to her neglect against my brother and I. From then forward, I bounced around after my mom's death at the age of 13 to different family members and group homes. Until the age of 17, while I was seven months pregnant, I finally moved out on my own. My journey didn't stop there. If anything, it really had just begun. I didn't get my first job until I was 18 years old. I had applied for the retail company Macy's. I started off making $8 an hour, which at the time was 75 cents above minimum wage. However, that wasn't enough. By the end of the year, I was on the verge of being homeless when I received a call from Philadelphia Housing Authority. The Philadelphia Housing Authority saved my son and I from being on the streets. I took this opportunity to go back to school, which was on and off day, and so I finally dropped out because I felt too defeated. I was overwhelmed with trying to manage being a full-time mom, working full-time, going to school, by 2014, I was working two jobs just trying to make ends meet. I resigned from Macy's in 2015 and got hired with the school district of Philadelphia. Working at the district, I was able to double my annual salary to then making $10,000 annually. I know that still isn't much, but for me, it was better than having to work multiple jobs just to keep my head above water. People assume because you're in housing that you had things made for you. I've seen numerous of comments on social media that people make about individuals on government assistance. They think everyone's rent is cheap and that most people get to do other things with their money because of the assistance. People think we're lazy or that we're users, and that's the furthest from the truth. When you're a determined person and you have goals for yourself, housing can just be a stepping stone for you. I never had the intentions on living off of government assistance for the rest of my life. I had one particular goal at the time to achieve, which I finally did, August 2021. My greatest achievement was being a homeowner and being able to give my children stability that I didn't have growing up. I worked my butt off for years to get the best credit working with a financial counselor, saving up money by working two jobs until I was able to get one with better pay. I used different programs such as IDA with United Way that I found on my own by Googling. I was able to move to a different position in the district, which allowed me to achieve becoming a homeowner. My dreams and aspirations don't stop there. There are other things I have left that I want to get done. I want to be able to show other women that despite their current situations, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I believe that everyone deserves a chance and opportunity to do better and be better. I so deeply wish that uh, Akira could be here with us today for this conversation as well. Um, and so not to hold her up and, and we all sort of watch her while she's not here, but I know she's she's been a very uh, important 
partner in this work as well. So I'd like to bring up our panelists here. I'd like to start, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Anne Price, who is the president of the Insight Center. Um, Anne is the first black woman president of the Insight Center. Um, and she leads, she leads a small but very mighty team uh, that creates groundbreaking work. And Anne has been featured in national news outlets uh, as a national um, expert, and she's deep, she's thinking very deeply with her team um, around the role that narratives play and how we think about wealth building, particularly in Black communities. So, with that, I want to welcome Anna to the panel. Next, I'd like to in introduce Diane Hornman Levy, who is um, I love this the chief disruptor of Women's Way, um, a incredible nonprofit organization based here in Philadelphia that is doing work to address um, the gender wealth gap and I think has done a lot of work around the, the bringing a racial equity lens to that work. So um, Diane has a wonderful 30 year career in nonprofit um, and she's just brilliant. And so I am so grateful to welcome Diana to the front. And finally, but not last but not least, Marquita Morris Lee, who is the CEO of Compass Working Capital, um, very longtime friend and, and brilliant uh, nonprofit leader here in Philadelphia, thinking very deeply about asset building and the structures around that, not just what we do for individuals. And so, with that, I want to also welcome up Marquita Morris. -Lee. So I want to just give each person a moment to sort of introduce who you are and how you've been approaching this work. So we'll take, you know, each one down the line here. Um, and then I want to open us up to a, to a more broader and general question uh, to kick off the discussion. So I'll begin and tell us a little bit about the work that you do and the role of narratives. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here with you all this afternoon and um, this marvelous panel. Um, I started this journey about 11 years ago, and I am a trained policy analyst and worked in many, on many issues. I was a hunger advocate, a child advocate, um, worked in issues of higher education, um, led poisoning in black communities. Um, when I started this work on wealth, um, I really start to think that something is holding us back. What is keeping us from making progress on addressing racial wealth inequities? Um, as we really were exploring the drivers of wealth inequality, I think we were missing one major driver, I think a key driver, and that's narratives. When I started this work, I didn't know much about this, and I began to work with some cognitive scientists and linguists to really understand what narratives were all about. And I know that that word is thrown around and people talk about narrative change and um, sometimes it's hard to wrap your arms around what that means. But what I'm talking about is really people's mental models and how they come to see the world, right? How they make sense of the world mm -hmm. um, and how deeply embedded that is in, in, in our political and social economic systems. Um, it took me on a journey. We did some research at the Insight Center to really understand this more deeply. And that really led us to some really key things that we learned that we've been building off of ever since. We did narrative research across the country. We did a lot here in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia, talking to ordinary Americans to understand how they think. Now, one of the things I really think that I learned is you know, we were trained to write beautiful language. We were trained to be persuasive. We were trained around messaging. And I thought that that alone was good enough. And I quickly learned that perhaps I was doing more harm than good. And I would challenge us to say that much of our work, and it may sound harsh, that we may be doing harm unknowingly because we embrace harmful narratives because we don't really think about mental models, right? So let me just run through really quickly what we learned in our research. The one thing we learned is that most people think the economy is natural, right? That it's not man-made. And we know that the economy is just made up of decisions, 
It's really a series of decisions. This also lends itself to racial wealth inequities, that somehow some of this is natural. And even the way that we talk about gaps, and I know that language is, is branded and we use it all the time, and sometimes I use it, but it really leans into a narrative in people's mind, their mental model, that this is natural, that these disparities are natural. Gaps in people's minds are natural, like the Grand Canyon. So understanding that even simple words in people when we use them really give people a framework of how they see the world. Um, the second thing we learned is a lot of Americans believe that personhood is related to work. What do I mean by that? That you're not a fully realized person, a human being, unless you're tied to work and traditional work, right? And this is really deep seated. Um, you know, there's work been done that has looked at beyond political affiliation, Republican or Democrat, that a third of white Americans believe that black people are subhuman. And so we're really fighting against this idea of deservedness and who is actually valued and how they're treated. Um, the third most predominant narrative is around personal responsibility. And I know we've talked a bit about that was lifted up. But basically, people believe that it's individual choices and behaviors that drive economic prosperity, period. It is one of our most deeply held narratives in this country. And it ranges across political beliefs, across uh, political affiliation. It is deeply embedded. And finally, you know, to no surprise that all of these are tied up in deep, deep racial resentment, really most held around black people, um, really almost falling short of saying, you know, there's a biological shortcoming of black people. And so I wanna just say that in thinking about racial wealth and equality, if we're not committed to dislodging dominant thinking, we can't achieve structural change, period, right? This is not just somebody's work, it's all our work. And I think sometimes we think that, you know, when we think about the ideas and bold solutions, I know we're going to hear a lot of that today. Why we can't achieve those. What's in our way? These narratives, this mental models, these mental models blind us to understanding that racial wealth and equities are deeply structural. They keep us from understanding why, how wealth is accumulated in this country and how it's extracted. Um, I call personal responsibility our mac and cheese. It's something that makes us feel so comfortable. It's our go-to, right? We snuggle up with it, right? Um, and no matter what the issue, folks tend to bounce back to personal responsibility as a driver of economic mobility, right? So we know that there's aspects around personal responsibility. Okay. 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 Back on. That are important. That's like no decisions make a difference. But the way in which that's weaponized, the way it's used means that we do not invest in our social safety net. It means that our investments in cities that were mentioned look different right? Because this is all about deservedness and who is deserving, right? So that, that alone keeps us from being able to make changes. Um, I think that, you know, wealth flips the script on our understanding of the economy of this country. And we tend to gravitate towards what I call the trifecta, business ownership, home ownership, and education as drivers, because it's built on this belief that if you just work hard, if you just study hard, that you will get there. And I think that Dania talked a lot about that in her remarks on why those myths um, and, and the, the constraint of choices really matter. I, I wanna also say to understand, cause what, you know, I think there's amazing research that's being done on wealth and we have a lot of facts and we, utilize that in our work and it's important. 
But for the average American, oftentimes those facts, what we call, they bounce off of frames. Facts bounce off of frames. If this doesn't align with your belief, and largely that belief is it's about individual behavior and choices, you cannot accept that fact. You can't accept those graphs. You can't accept the research that's done. And so, you know, I think that one of our challenges is to, you know, really deeply think about how we're gonna actually make this change. I hear a lot of, there's a lot of initiatives about closing the racial wealth gap. And I often say, really, are you going to close the racial wealth gap with a financial literacy program? So we have a, you know, this, is, this has been longstanding. I've been at this work for 11 years. I go around, I'm in many communities, been working with local folks, and it's extremely difficult to dislodge this thinking. It's sticky. It's very, very sticky. <laughs> Right, And so our challenge is, how are we, those folks that are committed to addressing this issue, going to chip away this deeply seated kind of thinking? And so I know that's something we're gonna get into the panel, so I'll stop there. Thank you. I wanna move on to Diane. Sure. If you could tell us a little bit about Women's Way and the sure. narrative program and the work that you all have been doing around Yeah, um, uh, just briefly, I, um, I've been doing social justice work most of my life. I was raised by two parents and I, I always thought I was doing great good, right? You know, intention. And, and as I dug deeper into this whole, um, these narratives that, that were in my head, um, from the very beginning of my life, um, I realized that oftentimes I was doing harm when I thought I was doing good. I see this all the time. I see it from service providers. I see it from volunteers, white folks going in black neighborhoods and like, we're going to help clean up your neighborhood, right? Um, acting like they know what's better for people and never even listening to them. Um, so I am um, first going to be very uh, honest that I've done a lot of harm when I thought I was doing good. Um, and so part of this work, particularly for white people, and I'm gonna say this for white women, you, we need to start examining our own mental models. Well, mm, that part. And, and, and I think what we often do is look outward. It's always, let's fix them. They need to change, we don't. Mm -hmm. And if we want equity, we have to start looking at ourselves, at our own personal narratives, and how they're playing out in all of our work on how we talk, on the decisions, on how we practice. So at Women's Way, when I got there in 2017, it was predominantly white women on the board. Mm -hmm. And I said, we have to deal with racial inequities if we're gonna deal with gender inequities. And they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like, like women are a monolithic group. Mm. And it took me, almost five years for my board to do a deep dive of examining internalized white supremacy in their mental models. Mm -hmm. So we hired two consultants, it took me five years to say, yes, we're gonna do this. I said, the change has to start within ourselves. I know that's like be the change, but it's, <laughs> it's so true. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna, I'm calling out all white folks that you know, it's like we, had, we always focus on the other people, the other, we have to start with ourselves. So I, one of the things I talk to people about, if you want to create systemic change, we are the system. We have to start with our own mental models, our own organizations, with our boards, with executive directors, with staff. It has to be integrated. It, we have to start examining that. And it doesn't just, it's not DEI work, it's something deeper. Uh, DEI is just, I don't know, I have a whole issue with that. <laughs> Um, we called it an intervention mm. and it's a lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we have changed our whole theory of change. We at Women's Way believe that the core root of all inequities is a system based on white supremacy, mm -hmm. which is a racialized gendered hierarchy of human value. And in order to really promote gender equity, we have to dismantle white supremacy and what upholds it is anti-blackness. And what upholds that is narratives. <laughs> 
narratives of the welfare queens, the lazy people living off the public system, making bad choices, those are systematically intentionally held by people in power to make sure that we continue to, to dehumanize and devalue black people. So guess what we're doing? We're gonna center blackness in their experiences to bring humanity back to the people who have been oppressed by this country. And we're gonna keep doing that. The, the other side, they are brilliant at narratives. Right, they're simple, and they keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And part of white supremacy is conditioning our minds with those narratives. I agree with Anne. That's why I'm here, and also this amazing woman, Marquita. We have to incorporate narrative change and our theory of change into our work, into our culture, into our own mental models. So that's all I'm going to say. Marquita. There's about to be some true spoken on this panel. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can y'all hear me out there? Yeah. Oh, man, I have so much to say. So where do I start? Um, I'm going to start with Compass Working Capital. is a national nonprofit, and our mission is to end asset poverty for families with low incomes and help families with low incomes, particularly those led by Black and or Latinx women, build assets as a pathway out of poverty. And part of our work is around creating asset building opportunities and integrating those with financial coaching. So not coaching for coaching's sake, but as an add-on, as a support, the way we allow families with more financial means to have access to high quality professional financial advising. And we also shape policy solutions that dismantle barriers that prevent families with low incomes from building assets. There's this wonderful quote from James Baldwin where he said, America is obsessed with innocence. No one wants to be culpable. Mm -hmm. So that's why we perpetuate narratives of individual action. Um, we socialize failure, but individualize success. Um, no one wants to be at fault. We all want to be innocent. And so these narratives, the, the counter narratives we want to build implicates somebody. <laughs> somebody did this, right? These systems that Professor, Professor Francis talked about that we all are well aware of belong to someone, benefited others, and disadvantaged many others. I choose to use the language when talking about racism in our systems. I use the language of caste. Um, which comes from Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast the Origin, Origins of Our Discontent, because for me, it's such a helpful framework when talking about dominant caste and a subordinated caste, right? And a subordinated caste, if, you, if I have to articulate it, is Black people who have been formerly enslaved in this country, Black people. Um, so that's where a lot of this comes from. That's the bones of the, of the conversation that we're having and the, and the work that we're all trying to, to do. That's, and I believe that language is truly important. I think about, you know, even Diane mentioning white women. When we talk about um, disadvantaged groups, we'll say white women and people of color. Mm -hmm. Where do women of color fit into that, right? Or we say women and people of color. When we really mean white women and men of color, or we mean people of color, you know, we, we mean men of color and all women. So we just need to be really conscious of our language and be and very thoughtful about the narratives and the stories we tell. Um, I am, as you heard Akira's story this morning or just before our, our panel, and we have thousands of stories like Akira's. And I think their stories inspired me to be much more intentional about telling my personal story. Right. Um, I grew up in a household where there was financial challenge, receiving public benefits. Mr. Williams actually grew up at West Poplar at 13th and Wallace and also in Strawberry Mansion and went to St. E's for a minute. So I definitely come from the communities that we're trying to serve. And I recognize the power of that sitting in this body. Mm -hmm. Right. And the access that I have in spaces like that. So it is incumbent upon me to share that story. But I share that story with you hesitantly, and also the story of my grandparents who, you know, made that great trek from Alabama to Philadelphia in the 50s. I'm a child of the Great Migration. And my grandfather, in fact, was run out of 
Alabama. So that's a story we often don't hear. We think that people made choices to leave. That was not a choice. He was run out of Alabama for daring to get a job as a driver. His family was threatened. His life was threatened. He had to leave. Um, probably he would have stayed. It is also a narrative that the Great Migration was beneficial to African Americans, and there's some research that puts that into doubt and into question. But the reason why I share that is because we all know the stories of Black disadvantage, not getting access to the GI Bill, been, you know, being uh, targets of redlining um, and racially predatory financial products. What we don't hear is the stories of white advantage. Yes. So for any time I tell my story, and I hesitate to tell it because I, I need a white person to tell their story <laughs> of how their families benefited from the GI Bill when mine didn't, how they benefited from racially restrictive covenants, how they benefited from the implement, you know, implementation of the 30-year mortgage, how they were not denied access to credit building opportunities. So when we talk about narrative, the fuller story is one that incorporates both black stories of black disadvantage and how white advantage came to be because of choices, policy choices our country's made. So I hope that we uplift that in today's conversation and on an ongoing way as we talk about the power of narrative in shaping policy. So uh, for our first question to just sort of kick us off, um, as I mentioned, at the Equitable Wealth Roundtables, Anne and her team were here to help us facilitate these really difficult conversations. And Marquita and Diane participated with many others um, in what was a six-month engagement. And so I wonder if, Anne, you could first just talk about the model of that sort of engagement, how that work comes about when we think about addressing narratives. And the second part of that question will go to Diane and Marquita. And then how has that impacted the way that you see uh, the work that you're doing? So beginning with Anne, and then we'll move to the others. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things when we think about moving the needle on racial wealth and equities, that this requires a lot of new learning and unlearning. Mm -hmm. And one thing I've learned over, you know, doing this work for a while is people really don't have a deep understanding of how wealth is accumulated or extracted, but people think they know, right? And why do they think they know is because they've heard these narratives, right? And they have these beliefs. And so this is not something that we've learned in school. This is, these are um, policies that oftentimes didn't get framed in a way that we can see them in terms of wealth accumulation. Um, this has been, I say this, this has been hidden from us. This, this issue has been hidden from us because it's a truth. It's an uncomfortable truth. It's a truth that we have a hard time grappling with. And most of the time when people come and they hear a presentation, they see some graphs and charts and they're like, wow, that's really, that's really terrible. Um, but we don't go deeper than that. This requires deep work. It's not a one-off. It's not a presentation. It's not just coming together for a forum and people going through a litany of policy solutions, right? It takes examination, it takes self-examination, it takes sitting with these truths, as Marquita's like said, sitting with your own stories, sitting with really what I think surprises people. I was just talking to a group of educators last week and this idea around education as being this equalizer. When people, even begin to understand it's wealth that equalizes educational outcomes, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Their minds are blown. I mean, I've seen people speechless because it challenges everything that we believe in. And that's what I think working on the issue of race, racial wealth and equality does. It challenges everything we've been told. It challenges us in the fact that some of these policies we never learned in history we never really talked about stolen land. We've never talked about theft and violence because it's uncomfortable. And we certainly don't want to talk about anti-Blackness. We can't talk about racial wealth and equality without talking and dealing with anti-Blackness. Even saying, and the work that we're doing is also centering Blackness, people don't even want to hear the word Blackness. I mean, people get so uncomfortable. So how are we going to deal with actually addressing racial wealth and equities? And so I think what I found so inspiring about 
the journey that Alicia and Sam took us on was we're going to go in on this for six months. I've never seen an engagement process that lasted that long and still some and still learning that this group wants to embark upon. Right. So I think that one of the challenges that we have, we love to talk about the racial wealth gap, but we don't want to do the work to actually move the needle on it and have the kind of investment in an engagement that will take us there. And it really does require all of us. It's collaborative. It's done in community. It's come. It's coming to understand where we are situated in our jobs and the work that we do. The tentacles of racial wealth and equality are wide, right? It's deep. So I think, you know, I love that this is being held today and, and that we're able to talk about this in new ways. And I love the fact that uh, we had two organizations really, really trying to help us think through another model of how we even start to get there. Thank you. So we'll start with Marquita and then we'll move to Diane. Tell me about, tell us about some of the ways in which, you know, this engagement, this work around narratives has started to um, influence or affect the way that you're thinking about um, Compass's work. Yeah, so our work begins with a fundamental belief in people. Um, and a practice, you know, we talk about a practice of radical empathy, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just kind of seeing someone's actions through, you know, your lens, but really understanding um, people's situations, right? Um, acknowledging when they're experiencing structurally constrained choices and how that affects their decision making and what's available to them. So it really begins with acknowledging people's both their agency, but also their dignity. And with our work, when we understand that these narratives, the narratives that people that are working against people, then we approach the work trying to affirm their sense of dignity, particularly when they're interacting with institutions that are dignity stripping. So that's a very important part of the of piece of the work. Um, and in listening to those stories, acknowledging when folks are experiencing those situations of self-blame, which um, Lisa mentioned earlier when talking about, um, you know, some of the interviews that she's did, she's done. We, we hear that from our clients, from the families that we serve all the time. And we try to counter that with just some education around the systems that are impacting their decision making, right? The benefits cliff, a lot of these things that many of us in this room are tackling all stem from narratives around deservedness. How long someone should benefit from um, government largesse or public assistance, whether anyone should benefit at all, right? Our thoughts about the time someone should take, you know, receiving supplemental nutrition assistance. Well, you know, my family, we might have needed it, but it was for just three to six months to get on our feet. Why can't you do the same? And those those narratives shape our policy making. I've been in rooms with policymakers where they use language like motivation to distinguish between outcomes, you know, of of one organization versus another. You're working with a more motivated population. Mm -hmm. And that is the most harmful thing in the world, but there's no kind of examination of the policies that they've put in place that create barriers for people to take the kind of steps we know they wanna take in their lives, right? Akira is just representative of thousands of families we work with who are kicking their butts every single day to build wealth for their families, to leave something for their children, to create um, opportunity in their communities, but they butt, butt their heads against brick walls on a daily basis, right? You take a step forward by earning more income, but then you're very quickly, all the su supports that buttress that step forward gets taken away. But instead we say, you're not working hard enough, you're not doing enough. But instead of acknowledging the policy barrier that we've all agreed to, right? That makes it difficult for that family to make that step forward. And so we need both a sense of radical empathy and understanding of their world, right? Of those forces, taking a step in those shoes and, and the will, the political will to no longer cling to innocence, 
to recognize all of our collective culpability in that system to make a change. A lot of our work, you know, we are very direct service kind of people focused organization for the longest time. But we've realized in the last several years that we can't just make the most of this current system. We also have to try to work to transform the system. And that work happens simultaneously because you can't just make the most of the system and hope that the folks in the future will benefit. And you can't just transform the system because the people who are here right now need something done. So you have to do that work and align. So those narratives and the need to kind of shape systems is really driving the way we're thinking about our work. And that we see ourselves as, you know, we joke that we're moving from junior varsity to varsity when it comes to policy work. Because if you're a direct service organization worth your salt, you need to be thinking about the systems that are impacting the lives of the families you're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Diane, maybe you can talk a little bit about how this engagement and, and addressing narratives has come up in, in your work as well. Yeah. Um, first, I'm going to talk about it as a white woman leader. Um, if we really truly believe in, in elevating and centering the voices of those most exploited, and it's actually uh, black women because of the intersection of race and gender, um, then I need to shut up. I need to listen more um, and be more vulnerable. So I do a lot more listening to those who have lived experience because those with lived experience know the solutions. Those closest to uh, inequities are closest to the solutions. So as a, as a leader, um, women with lived experiences are at the table, co-creating strategies, teaching us, we're listening. And then as someone who has benefited from white privilege, how do we leverage our resources, right? And how do we leverage all our connections? Let those who are impacted by injustices tell us what they need and then let us use our connections, our networks to leverage those resources and to put them in action. Mm -hmm. So narratives is, narrative change is critical. One, it's listening to narratives, to people's stories. Two, it's giving them the opportunity to tell their stories to all kinds of stakeholders. So through our fellowship program, which is a seven month program, uh, we have cohorts of 10 women go through this and we empower them and we support them to tell their stories, not in extractive ways, um, and, and then connect them with all kinds of opportunities to center their voices in different with different stakeholders. And one of the things that we're very passionate about is also we provide mental health support because trauma narratives have caused harm and has called major trauma. So if we're going to ask people to tell their stories, we need to provide support. So we raise money to provide mental health support for the women going through this. We also pay them because it's their intellectual property, they're experts. Mm -hmm. So we have to stop asking people to like open up their souls without supports. Um, and so this fellowship program, like we, once it ends, we stay connected with them. We continue to give them opportunities like they just met with Kelly Sheard, who's here, the director of the General Wealth Institute. They went, two of them went to a national conference in Atlanta. They were just here a couple of weeks ago yes. speaking at a national conference yes. that, the, so, um, that, they, that they hosted here for us, five of them. Right. So um, we're always like, so I'm not there. So I'm speaking today, but I prefer that they speak, not me. We need to decenter the white experience, to be honest, and center the black experience if we're talking about equity. Um, so I'm, I'm calling out all white leaders, like do more listening right, to those who are impacted by these injustices, bring them to the table. They will tell you what's needed um, and then leverage your incredible networks and resources to make things happen. It's one thing to listen and learn, but you gotta act. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say is we've been talking to philanthropy, which is a huge problem. I'm sorry if you're funders, <laughs> but they're part of the system, right? And this whole idea of like, we, we give money. What they really need to do is give decision-making power away. They need to, it needs to be flipped upside down. So we talk to funders now and say, we're not going to, we're not going to respond to an RFP because you think this is what the community needs. We're going to tell you what the community needs, how, how those resources should be distributed from those folks. And so we were very proactive in talking to funders about what, what needs to be done. Not me, it's the people with lived experiences that are informing funders. It needs to be totally flipped upside down. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, have we lost some funding? Yes, but that's the risk you take. That's mm -hmm. the messy work. Mm -hmm. If you're not uncomfortable, if you're not pissing people off, then you're probably not doing equity work. Mm 
Um, so. <laughs> I want to shift to one last question before I uh, open it up to your audience members. Um, and, you know, you talked about being in this work for 11 years and being able to collect narratives from individuals, but that, that has to be done with a certain intentionality um, so that we don't cause harm. And I wonder, just from a really practical perspective, and, and I'll open this question up to, to the rest of our panelists too, how might organizations, leaders who are here listening to this conversation start to approach, and obviously I'm just saying start here, start to approach um, doing this type of narrative work, collecting these narratives in their own communities in a way that doesn't cause harm? Well, first, you have to understand the harm you're already causing. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard for people to hear, and I'm not saying that I haven't had to grapple with this over my career. We caused harm. I remember days I worked on welfare reform and people were trotting out women so they could, you know, you had to find that right woman that had the right story um, and how exploitive and extractive we were in our approach. Um, how we also unknowingly leaned into very harmful narratives that really hurt our case. And that's, that's really what moved me to do this. It's like, we are hurting the case we're making because we have these deeply embedded narratives that we lean into. Um, and so first of all, we have to really understand what that looks like. You know, I think a first step is stop harming. And there are ways to learn. I mean, creating counter narratives is the super, super hard work. Stopping harmful narratives and leaning into those is probably some of the easiest work once you really understand what that looks like. We work with 10 organizations and we came together after this research I discussed and we said, hey, do you want to join us? We don't have any money because, of course, no one wants to invest in this. If we, you know, how do we think about cultural narrative change? And people were interested. And one thing we were able to do with the little resources that we had was hire someone to do to actually um, do an analysis of our websites, of the work that we were doing, some papers we were written, all of that, even the imagery that we use. And we were all able, all of us were able to see ways in which we were causing harm. And so I think that really starts there. I think the other thing is, and we, this was raised before about qualitative research. You know, I think it's important for people to be able to tell that story their life story, but how are we going into communities and doing that? Mm -hmm. Qualitative work has been, is white centered in its framing, in, its, in the way that it's extremely exploitive and extractive. And like Diane mentioned, you want someone to speak about some of their deepest, you want them to bear their soul, you want to talk about their lives of struggle. Um, we, we are obsessed with struggle. Mm -hmm. We're obsessed with looking into the lives of black people as struggle, um, as struggle only. And, and I'll tell you something that we have really moved away from. I mean, we're really talking about leaning in with, with hope and healing and joy. Mm -hmm. And so changing your philosophical approach to say, how am I leaning when, into healing, hope and joy? I love the idea Diane talked about having, um, you know, uh, mental health, uh, counseling provided. Um, we first started to say we're gonna we're gonna chuck some of those white centered approaches to focus groups, where you go and you pay someone twenty five dollars, ask them a whole bunch of questions, kind of leading them to the results you want because you told the funder this is what you were gonna collect, instead of letting people really speak their truth in a way that's not exploitive and extractive. So we decided to say we're. We're going to not do that approach. We're going to have some red table talks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so some red table talks, right? You know, is that going to fit within the academic frame of rigor? Mm. Yes, it can, right? Um, and that re revealed to us, and we had a clinician there with us, leading us. And that actually allowed for a deeper, not just what we want to get from someone, but really a community of people for even those three hours who, where they could even build community with one another, right? Um, we use writing letters and music and a whole host of other things. And we left with, you know, I mean, there was crying. Yeah. There was, you know, you had a, you know, you're going to see those stories about 
um, the stress that uh, Black people face, the challenges, but also the joys and hopes and dreams. Mm -hmm. And we left with hope and dreams, right? So I think that one, you know, we've been trained to do things in a certain way. And if we challenge ourselves to say that, the way in which we go about qual research was built by white people for white people. It wasn't built with black people in mind. And so I think for us, we are challenging ourselves. We are saying what we thought we knew. We are unlearning things that we um, learned in grad school, like how we've been doing this for, for many, many years. So I think that is so important. Diane lifted some of that up and Marquita about, we have to be willing to be uncomfortable. We have to be willing to be challenged and challenge ourselves. We have to think about how we're hearing people, not because we have a, a some um, predisposed objective that a funder told us we needed, mm. right? And we need to think about what harm we've caused mm -hmm. and say to ourselves, how have I caused harm? This, this thing around innocence. We don't want to say we've caused harm. Mm -hmm. No one wants to say that, but we have, and we continue to do it. So we can stop. We can learn. We can sit back and listen when we need to, and we can approach this so differently than what we've done. I think, you know, when I have gone into communities and I was in the Mississippi Delta and with folks and black folks that said, what's wrong with us? It was heartbreaking. What's wrong with us? What aren't we? We don't, we don't have, we aren't doing things right. There wasn't a bank to be found. There wasn't a job to be found. There was no infrastructure. There are places with no sidewalks that were not paved. And people believing that something is wrong with me are, you know, they, you know, folks hold those narratives. What did I do wrong? Right? Um, and so I really have seen from these 11 years that we, um, but there's another way if we really embrace it, if we sit with discomfort um, that we challenge and we challenge systems and structures. Yes, challenging philanthropy, right? Yes, yeah, sometimes you are not going to get that grant. Sometimes we've said no, but we stay true to our beliefs and our values. And I think that makes all the difference in the work that we're doing. Can I just add to that, Anne? Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, she with philanthropy, <laughs> we have to challenge the narrative that you can affect change in 12 months. Okay. Yes. Annual lighters is a condition that we all need to <laughs> rid ourselves of. We need to be inoculated against. And can I just add uh, that we have like, what is it, 2,300, like 3,000 nonprofits working on this issue. And you saw the gap has gotten worse. Yeah. It's not working, folks. It's not working. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's just start there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not. And millions and billions of dollars are going into this. And my real question is, do we really believe in equity in this country? I'm, 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 that's my, and I ask that to sometimes to folks, because that means giving up things. Mm -hmm. People in power have to give up. And that is a very hard discussion, but I'm telling you, I've never, I, I feel like I'm having those discussions more than I ever had in my life, which is hopeful, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think, you know, having these, I'm sorry, I just jumped in there. Go for it. I'm going to jump right behind you. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to go back to that. You've got to do the work on yourselves because I, I still say things like, holy crap, that was grounded in white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing this work now for years and I still have a lot of work to do in myself. And you do it and you think you're doing good and you're doing harm. And, and this whole DEI crap that doesn't have people looking at themselves and they hire a DEI officer is not going to change it. Mm -hmm. It's not until we do the work ourselves. And, and white people are not the only people who internalize are internalized it. white Thank supremacists. You. Yes, that just again. to be clear. That's right. and, and, I, and even around, I'm glad you said what you said, Anne, about kind of we need to do a complete narrative reframing because I used to fall into the trap of the tit for tat counter narrative, right? So if there's a narrative about people, a class of people, I'm gonna find the counter narrative story. 
but then I'm falling to the trap of individual stories driving this work. So we got to shift the frame, mm-hmm. like tell completely different stories in different ways and not have counter narratives that justify and buttress the white supremacist, supremacist narratives that we've all bought into. So that's that's what I would challenge us to do as well, like find not just new stories, but new ways to tell those stories. Mm-hmm. And that's a big piece of this work. Yeah. Y'all uh, said a word, and okay. I want to give just a few minutes because we are up on time. I could sit and talk to you all all day. Um, I want to open it up. We have time for two questions. I see I'm going to be uh, in this session. I'm going to try to be equitable if we've already we've heard from some people, uh, but I see a hand in the back here, and then I see right behind that another one, and then we'll wrap up this session. So in the, yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you. Can you please use the microphone to ask your question? Uh, Hi, um, I'm, I, I, I'm struck by that, what you've all said in, in really powerful ways. And I'm really thinking about it from an audience. And the audience I'm thinking about it is the investor class. I mean, I come from white privilege for sure. Um, and the question of how to change those narratives with that class, it's sort of what Diane's talking about it, but it feels like it needs to go deeper than that, um, has to be part of the solution. And, uh, and I wonder how, you know, do you see that as, as different? It's something that I, I am trying to work on myself. So I'm interested in how you look at that question. I'm so glad you asked that. I have, I have a quick answer. Um, the Aspen Institute is actually doing some great work around us and brought a group of us to, to start to have that conversation. And some of the kind of language that bubbled up is that closing the racial wealth divide, because Gap makes it seem like it's unintentional. I love that Professor Francis said that. Um, closing those gaps is good for our economy. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. And and so, and then, and then, you know, you use some of their language against them. Talk about narratives. Do you hate the economy? <laughs> do you hate, do you hate America prospering? This is part of the way you make America a prosperous, great nation. Just, you know, kind of, I've been thinking a lot about how to flip some of that language, right? Sometimes you have to use that language just to, uh, sometimes I just want the win, it's not about kind of situating yourself ethically in that moment, but it's more about getting the win. And in other places, I will try to completely shatter the narrative framework. But in that moment, when talking to investor class, you remind them of, your, of their self-interest, right? Derek Bell wrote about interest convergence. Find the self-interested narrative that will work for them, that has them close that, that awful, awful chart that Professor Francis showed us. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on that. Um, you know, we, we're trying to do a lot around with investors. We're, we're creating an investment fund to invest in women of color entrepreneurs at Women's Way. And I, it, first of all, demographics are shifting in this country. Whites are going to become the minority, first of all. So right. they're your customers. They're your investors. They're your purchasers, right? Mm-hmm. So so the pie gets bigger. This whole notion that there's the pie just like if they get more, we get less is, is a, it's a false narrative too. So it's actually... And all this data comes out when you have diverse teams. We're not, you know, we're not saying get rid of white people and have black people when we do this. We're talking about black, white, male, female. Actually, the return it, you have better outcomes. There's a great book, The Double X Edge. We're actually going to be hosting these authors. I don't know. We're, you should come to this December eighth, Richard. I, I've um, that. We've yeah. Talked a lot, so yeah. there's all this data that diversity actually improves better outcomes, better products, better investment returns, right? And so if you want to do it from a more capitalistic viewpoint and you talk to investors, you're missing out on all these incredible innovations, ideas, future customers, investors. I mean, it it's crazy, right? So I think you can come at even, I have major issues with our capitalistic system, but if we have a capitalistic system that works for all, don't we all benefit? I mean, don't we? Okay, we have one question there. Thank you for all your presentation. I want to talk about in terms of narratives, like like Diane mentioned, as far as the zero sum a notion, particularly um, the white population has, whereby they feel like in order for closing this gap, it also means that they have to 
sacrifice or um, and sacrifice not of their own choosing. And and with that in my consideration, like despite and considering the fact that I am a grandson who benefited from the GI Bill, you know, um, like to encourage participation and acceptance um, about this um, process and all, as well as this uh, goal endeavor. Um, I mean, this is deeply challenging, right? Because we know that when, you know, that there are folks who feel like something is going to be taken away from them. And it's, and there is some level of, um, well, there's a level of no, I don't think it's a truth. I don't either. I don't think it's a truth of being taken away. I think there's a level of a sense, there's a sense of ent of entitlement in some ways, right? You know, I think some of the misery that we see, and, and I, was, I was talking to someone who's doing research around this in white communities is saying, you know, then, you know, this issue of my life isn't what I thought it would be. And someone is taking that away from me. And black people are taking that away from me, right? Um, and I and I, I think that that, that that there's some some things that are really deeply seated there that are not going to be um, a very difficult to come to grips with. You know, when you just look, and I know that this was just you know, when you look at the range of policies and the money, the trillions and trillions of dollars in which you know um, white folks got land, in which. Um, you know, um, talking about land loss, you're talking about, I mean, every system that it touches, um, you know, there's not a sense that, that people feel that that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, they believe, you know, my grandfather did this, you know, my, you know, that there wasn't this gigantic investment by the government to enable people to have what they have. It's right. that other story that Marquita's talked about, right? And so I think that part of it is, you know, white people don't know themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't know themselves and because they haven't had to know themselves. And I think that grappling with that is difficult. Um, and, and especially in a time where people are very anxious about their lives. And so I'm just saying it's no easy feat, but I think that, you know, we know like through narrative structures are hard for people to see. It's hard for people to see structures. It's just, that is the way that that our country has been framed. And it, these aren't innocent narratives. It doesn't just like happen. There's investment in those narratives. The same people you wanna talk about investing, people have put millions and hundreds of millions of dollars to ensure these narratives still flourish. This is not innocent. It's not by happenstance. It's extremely intentional you. because, you know, some folks don't have wealth because others do, right? right? Their wealth is taken and it's extracted so others can build wealth. And it's hard for people. How am I doing that? You know, and not seeing it as something more systemic or something over generations of, of policies. So I just say that these notions are are challenging and there's no it's not easy it's going to take time to dislodge this thinking but i don't think that we've really and i would say this when i've asked white people to come with me so that you can talk about these issues from that perspective everyone has said no mm -hmm. i don't want to do this so i just think that the work has to be done and people have to have the moral courage to do it and really understand why they are positioned the way they're positioned. How is wealth hoarded? How do people have resources? You know, Jeff Bezos just didn't become a billionaire. That, all of that, you know, philanthropy who's giving us money, how did they get that wealth that they're holding on to? You know, $142 billion is being just locked for donor investment, for donor investment, $142 billion. It's just sitting there. Yeah. So like, this is something that we, there's some truths here that we're gonna have to 
begin to grapple with if we're going to move on this. And and not saying it's easy, but it, it, it can start somewhere for sure. Can I just say, and, and um, there's a book called Some of Us. It's a okay. great book. I don't know if you read it. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, I just, it's, I think every white person should read this book. Um, but it shows that how white people are hurting themselves by upholding the white supremacist system. And she gives one great example when we had public pools, right? And they were segregated. And it was a great resource for white families, right? And then they integrated them. And because of racism and anti blackness, the white folks go, oh my God, we had to close the pools. Well, you've seen this in Philadelphia, right? They closed the pools. They lost a resource for their children because of anti-blackness. I mean, there's just millions of examples. And also, I, it's doing harm to us to hold on to this. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say this to white women. We need to let go of patriarchy, right? We got to, we, because we hold on to that too. And also, we try to assimilate to a white dominant system that is grounded in sexism as well. Mm -hmm. And we hold on to that because, well, that's how we make it in corporate America. So it's really doing harm to us, all of us. And I think we have to give concrete examples of that and how we'll be more free, how violence will decrease in our communities when everyone is, when the economy works for all. It, it will benefit all of us. And that's, but, so I'm saying that's what we have to keep illuminating to those who are in that position of privilege and power. If you love America, you will let go of harmful narratives. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Marquita just said a word. <laughs> So I that hope that you all realize and see from this discussion, I wanna thank our panelists so much for being so candid and, and being willing to come here and do this work that you know every time I hear the conversation about narratives, I still am sweating. I feel the discomfort <laughs> every time. And it takes a long time and it's a lot of work to do. Um, but I hope that what we can demonstrate here is that it's a key ingredient in how we also think about our policy solutions and how we design what we have at our disposal. So with that, I want to please join me in a round of applause of our panelists.